Welcome back to Freight Waves Coronavirus Freight Market Update for Tuesday, March 24th. This is our bi-weekly coronavirus freight news and market condition focus interactive show where we invite viewers and those of you self-quarantined working from home to get answers on COVID-19 and how it's impacting our industry. We're happy to answer any questions on Freightways LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. I'm Tim Dooner here with Michael Vincent. Glad to be here. Michael Welcome. Vincent, we are going to start with some good news, but first let's get to the numbers. And, and the reason I want to bring this up is they're stark, right? Last Thursday yeah. when we did this, the U.S. coronavirus case count was at 13,789. Yesterday's right. numbers put us at 43,734. Deaths were at 207, and we are now at 553. Yeah, there's, there's, they're very, very scary numbers, aren't they? I mean, it, it really... Uh uh, it puts a little damper on the mood when you see things uh, exponentially jumping like that. But, uh, you know, in, in the same vein, though, we were warned and should be prepared to see these type of things, right, as we get more testing out there and uh, really start to get our act together or yeah. hopefully get our act together, right? But, I mean, we knew this was going to happen. We knew it wasn't going to be like, you know, 13,000 and then the next day 13,001 and, and so on and so forth, right? As, it, as this thing moves, it is highly contagious, obviously, yes. and it's moving. Uh, but we're also being more and more aware of testing earlier on, right? Instead of waiting for critical or, uh, uh, I guess, the critically ill to then just test them so that we're getting more and more tests inside there. So... Uh, hopefully we'll get a we'll get a, a beat on this and and you know we're just what a week into uh, work at home the great work at home experience for some of us yeah absolutely right? for for some of us and and uh, we're getting more and more lockdowns I guess or 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 live at home or stay at home type of lockdowns those type of things and and people are taking uh, hopefully starting to take social distancing and and gathering in smaller groups more uh, you know more seriously so hopefully we can quell the tide. Let's get to some good news. Eric yeah. Kulish reports that Express Carriers, FedEx Corp, and UPS are helping the U.S. government open drive-up coronavirus testing centers in dozens of communities to deliver specimens to laboratories. The companies have a long history of assisting humanitarian operations and have the ability to quickly flex their freight networks to meet these urgent logistics needs. We, You just mentioned all these tests, right? And right. When you have more tests, you're going to have more positives. Yeah, you are going to have more positives, and this is and this is good news. But I, I thought I read there was like a 45 minute turnaround now on one of these tests that uh, somebody's now got permission to start producing and sending out, which is kind of cool. I, I, I don't understand completely the the logistics of what they're doing here. I get it, and it's and it's great, and it's something needed. It is definitely good news. Yeah. But how does that work? You drive up, you get tested, you drive home, and sit for three days to get it back, or an hour or two hours. I, I, that part I, I'm well, not quite clear on. You know. Walmart, Target, CVS Health, and Walgreens, 10 days ago, they told the White House that they would set up coronavirus testing in their parking lots. I personally haven't seen these yet here in Chattanooga. No. I don't know if you've come across them yet, but they could be in other parts of the United States. I, I come here, I go home. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't, I have not, I have not seen them nor heard about them yet, but hopefully we do hear about them and they're working well. Automakers are also pitching in. Fiat Chrysler Automobile said it's installing machinery to make more than 1 million protective face masks. Those are still very hard to find. They'll be doing that per month. Uh, Ford Motor Company on Tuesday is working with 3M and GE Healthcare to speed up production of medical equipment for healthcare workers, including redesigned 3M powered air purifying respirators and simplifying the version of GE's respirators that are out there. Automakers, uh, General Motors and Tesla are also helping to make some of these ventilators. Yeah, those are the, that's also good news. Everybody kind of jumping in, right? And as uh, Todd Maiden reported, <clears throat> excuse me, at JB Hunt Transport Services announced that it would pay a one-time $500 bonus to drivers and personnel supporting those drivers at company and customer facilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The bonuses will be paid out on Friday to eligible employees, uh, employee drivers, as well as field employees and managers which is good news. It's going to become even more important. We're going to talk to Andrew Cox in just a bit. He's going to tell us about some of these stark unemployment numbers, but yeah. some of this corporate welfare and goodwill. Like we mentioned yesterday on What the Truck, we're not just trying to flatten the curve of the spread of the disease, but also the impact across industries. And with unemployment, that system's being taxed too. So if you can flatten the curve there with the amount of claims coming in, that's going to help out. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that we can do, because it, you know, it, the, the talk now is in 15 days, are we going to start going back to work with the headlines and so on and so forth but we have to start thinking about these type of things as as what are we going to do to stem that tide of of destroying the economy right which when you look at these uh, economic numbers and the unemployment numbers that andrew's going to talk about um 
they're quite frightening at, uh, when you when you, you first hear them. Yeah. And uh, no as doubt. Brian Strait reports, Uber Freight is offering truck drivers weekly credits on Uber Eats and is cutting out profit margins on relief loads booked through its platform as the digital freight brokerage focuses on improving the supply chain during this COVID-19 crisis. The company will also offer sanitization material to drivers. Uber Freight plans to send drivers $20 tax credit towards meals on Uber Eats. They're also waiving delivery fees, which is good because... I don't know if you've ordered Uber Eats before, but that twenty dollars will not go that far. Where they do have the fees in place. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it won't. So that that's good news too. Everybody's supporting the the, the truck drivers and helping keep things moving in the economy. A, a, absolutely essential, and, and absolutely essential in helping quell the fears and the panic buying that the trucks are moving, that what you need is going to be on the shelves, uh, and that the grocery stores and are going to be there with and, and be stocked, right? And we, we keep things moving for, for people is, is very important for that mental health and, and, and quelling the, 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 the panic buying, if you will. Yeah, let's let's talk to market expert Andrew Cox. He's done a lot of research for our Passport Research team. He did a deep dive on unemployment over the weekend. He's going to bring us some of those numbers, and he did warn us that this is not going to be the easiest of conversations. Andrew Cox, thank you for joining us. Dooner, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I did a deep dive this weekend where, <clears throat> in which I looked at a statement that Secret at Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said, uh, actually it was the beginning of last week, it was Monday or Tuesday, he had a meeting with Republican senators and stated that he believed that the U.S. unemployment rate could reach 20% if significant fisc fiscal action wasn't taken uh, in the near term. And whether or not that was a threat to those senators to try to get them to act on this fiscal policy is, is still up in the air, but I went ahead and went ahead and modeled what, uh, what industries would be hit the hardest and what the modern economy would look like with a 15 or 20 percent unemployment rate. What did you find out? What, is, what does that economy look like? Well, the, the, the sad thing is that a lot of the industries that are really being affected the most by these lockdowns and quarantines are massive, uh, un, uh, massive employed um, industries. So you look at just, just two off the top of our minds are retail and restaurants and food services. I mean, just together, these two make up nearly 30 million jobs in the U.S. So, uh, you know, and I, I estimated that these two sectors would likely lose or would likely have to cut off 50 percent of their uh, employees. And that's I based all of my estimates on layoff estimates in the model based on uh, reduction and and decrease in revenue that's going to be coming forth in the next couple of weeks. That's already happened, but will continue to get worse as more shutdowns happen. Uh, and, you know, I just estimated what it would look like with fiscal stimulus and what it would look like without. And I found out that uh, using some some pretty basic layoff estimates, you know, the, the hardest hit industries are airlines and, uh, you know, package tours, such as anything from casinos to museums to, uh, you know, these, these big you know, package tours that people take, those are going to be hit the hardest. It's almost near cancellation. We're looking at 80 or 90 percent reduction in revenue in the short term. Uh, so these industries just physically aren't going to be able to keep up uh, the payment to their workers. So you're going to see massive layoffs in those industries, which aren't as big as retail and, uh, and, and foods. But retail and foods especially, we've seen in Chattanooga, uh, for example, I, one of the more prominent food groups here has laid off everybody uh, except for just high level management for the short term. So these layoffs are going to be massive. I, you know, I don't know if we reach that 20% unemployment because I do think that the fiscal stimulus is going to curve some of the effects, but I do think we get the double digits here in April or May. Michael Tomasek, he has a question he wrote in on Facebook. Do you guys have any info on transportation unemployment? TQL was a big story. The numbers have yet to be verified on that, anywhere from 150 to 1,000. We're not sure. We know there's been layoffs across the board, though. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? There has been layoffs across the board, and you know we have our new um, the new data that will come out on unemployment that'll come out to the beginning or first weeks of April. So we'll have the March numbers. Weekly's jobless claims is going to come out uh, Thursday, so day after tomorrow, and we're expecting a massive jump, one of the biggest jumps, actually the biggest jump in the history since we've been keeping this data since the 70s. Uh, if, if there's a there's actually a graph from Goldman Sachs that kind of shows the the history of weekly jobless claims on a 30 year on a 30 year map, uh, and it just hovers in between 200,000 and 600 thousand for the last four decades and then Goldman Sachs is estimating now that we'll be upwards of two million uh, coming come Thursday so Yes, transportation is getting hit hard. Get hit hard, not quite as hard as retail or uh, or food consumption, but 
you know, the things that fill those, you got to think about it in a, in a cycle. If, if the demand is falling for retail goods and for food services, the people that stock the shelves at the retail, um, at the retail places and the people that deliver the food to those restaurants are also going to be out of work as well. There's a, there's a cycle here. Uh, so yes, we, we, we don't have exact numbers on how many people will get laid off in transportation, but we're already seeing people getting laid off, whether it be PAM Transport or TQL or, or all across the board, we're seeing layoffs happen. How will stimulus help this out, especially in the transportation sector where a lot of our viewers and, and listeners uh, are mostly concerned? Well, unfortunately, currently the, the talks of stimulus haven't been aimed directly at transportation. We're seeing other industries that have been hit disproportionately hard, like airlines and casinos and even cruise ships that have been kind of asking for more uh, or have been demanding more stimulus than transportation has. But with that said, though, uh, I do believe there's, I, I think the fiscal stimulus, stimulus is going to cut in half, at, at least half the, the economic impact to unemployment. And my reason for thinking that is I do believe the government is going to require all companies that receive fiscal stimulus to uh, retain all their employees. I think that's the only kind of way to keep these companies accountable. If we give them money, they have to, uh, have to guarantee us that they won't fire their employees. And the reason I think that works is because the cost of the loans to these employers uh, with repayment over the next three to five or ten years will be far less than what the cost of the federal safety net that we're going to have to uh, throw out to, to take care of these unemployed people, these people that have been laid off. Andrew, Andrew, is there a time frame on that st stimulus? Meaning, uh, you, you say that it'll help. It'll help by you're, you're estimating by 50 50 percent. Is there a time frame to that? I mean, if it goes past, say you know, say we're still on the uprise or, or not on the back end of this thing in two months, does, does there another stimulus that needs to be done or what, what's the time frame for this? What is, what is the effect? In other words, is this stimulus to help us through the summer if it happens to go through August or, or what? Or is there any time frame on it? Sure, that's a, that's a lovely point. There's actually been some debate back and forth between uh, between the parties uh, in the Senate and the House. You know, uh, Democrats are calling for multiple stimulus packages, like this this first $1,000 or $1,500 stimulus package to uh, consumers will only be the beginning of this. And you know, the Republicans are saying we need to get back to work. We need to get, give them a little stimulus now, but we need to get people back to work. That will help our government, or that'll help our economy. You know, whether or not which plan eventually plays out, I don't, I'm not here to predict. I do personally believe that we're going to need multiple stimulus packages. I don't think that we're going to be able to get back to work. And if we do get back to work, I think we're going to see another uh, skip up in the coronavirus cases and deaths. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that I think that's a good idea to get back to work anytime soon. Uh, so with that said, I think that we're going to have multiple stimulus packages moving forward. I think we get one done hopefully this week. It seems that uh, every, every TV station we have on here in the, in the office says that we're going to have a stimulus package at least by the end of the day or, or by the end of the week. So I'm hoping something comes soon. You know, we're looking at two to three weeks after the package is passed before we actually see that money hit uh, our bank accounts as consumers. But I don't think that's going to wane off all of these problems. I think we're going to have more stimulus coming later on. One of the things that Michael and I were looking at this morning was General Electric, the report that they laid off 2,500 of their people, about 10% of its workforce and its jet engine business due to a decline in demand. Does this have anything to do with the, the MAX or is it a convergence of things? You have, you have the perfect storm of the MAX and coronavirus. What do you think about that report, Andrew? Yeah, I think you're right, Dinner. I think it's a perfect storm. I think you have these, these underlying issues of the, the 737 MAX from Boeing that's been grounded. They still haven't got it back to uh, you know, working, uh, working procedures. And then you, know, you just have this terrible storm of, uh, of the sentiment of behind travel that's really been hurt here. The, I think one of the more long-lasting issues of this coronavirus is going to be the sentiment of going into big crowds or the sentiment of traveling that people are going to have. We may get the economy up and running, but I think people are still going to be reluctant to go to a baseball game or get on a plane and go to a different country. I think that idea of being in large crowds at airports and, and large public gatherings is going to stick with people for a long time. That, that's a good point. I mean, even, even if, <clears throat> let's say, and, and hopefully very, very soon in the next month or so, we're on the backside of this and we can, you know, we've, we've got uh, a, a cure or whatnot. Let's just say we're on the backside of this thing in, say, four weeks. And, and, hey, social distancing is over. Go back to work. We're still going to need some type of social or some type of stimulus, right? I mean, because now you're going to have, what, two million people all vying for these jobs for these companies that have been shut down and now are just starting to come up and consumer confidence obviously probably not going to be really, really high at that point. That's a good point, Michael. Andrew, do you think that, because we're talking about reshuffling the whole deck here with, 
with 30% unemployment, do you think a lot of companies are going to be offering their old employees their jobs back? Are people going to be looking for jobs in other positions? How does this play out? I think that's the importance of the timing here. Like this, this That's why people are getting so upset with, uh, with their senators online and with the, the partisanship that's happening right now, especially in the Senate, is that this has to get done now. Time is of the essence. We can't wait any longer. People are having to lay off their people today, tomorrow, the end of the week. We have to get money not only into the consumer's hands, but into businesses' hands so that they, and, and with that money that is handed to businesses, there has to be, uh, you know, there has to be an understanding that they cannot fire anybody or they'll have to repay that debt later on or, or, or you know, whatever the, whatever the wording is there, but they cannot lay off people. They have to keep people in their jobs. Uh, and maybe the federal government steps in to, to pay some bills, to pay whether it be rent or, uh, or loan, loan forgiveness. There has to be other things because even in my with stimulus um, model, I estimated that we're going to see unemployment upwards of 10% or around 10%. So that's just a massive drag on the economy, not for the next couple months, but for several quarters moving forward. Andrew, thank you very much for your report. We appreciate it, and we'll, we'll touch base back with you. Now if we can bring up economist Anthony Smith. He has been looking at the numbers and, and what the world will look like if, as you suggested, or as Trump suggested, we go back to work in two weeks versus a much longer period of play here. Uh, we do have a couple comments online. Let's get to them real quick on Facebook, though. Mark Daughtry says, nurses and truck drivers are the real American heroes. There are a lot of different sectors that are contributing, but healthcare and transportation are the bookends fighting this virus. Michael Tomasak, he says, thank you, gentlemen. I have some work in Rock Island, Illinois. If you know any drivers looking for work, does FreightWaves have a platform for recruiting? Yes, we do. We have FreightWaves.careers. Definitely go and check that out and look for jobs. Um, as we just talked about that unemployment thing, I'm not sure how active all of these things are. I know Kevin Hill does a lot of surveys. We'll talk to him about what uh, headcounts are looking like at the moment. Uh, Steve Dunn, he's a, he says, I'm a grain hauler. I'm shut down until March 30th, and thank God my employer is paying us. God bless you all. Hey, stay strong. Steve, Anthony wow. Smith, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So what's going on? Get us up to date on economics, and we'll dive deep a little bit here. Sure. Um, well, just listening to Andrew Cox, he covered a lot of great stuff here. Um, I think the biggest part that we have to really kind of keep in mind is the consumer's condition. And so, as he mentioned, uh, unemployment rates are really going to be up there with weekly jobless claims, showing the pace of layoffs within the economy, really skyrocketing, and that's expected to continue to rise. Um, job openings, of course, going to be very limited, um, other than potential grocers looking for stocking or um, e-commerce giants like Amazon that announced that they're looking for to hire 100 plus thousand. Um, but other than that, it's going to be very limited on the job opening side. Um, could, could it be early since we still don't have a cover on containing and testing? Could returning in two weeks be too early? Um, returning in two weeks could definitely be very, very early. Um, when we're looking at two weeks, because when we're looking at the landscape now, we're still looking at a lot of regions that are being adversely impacted compared to other regions. Another thing is that we're seeing that there hasn't been that huge amount of testings that's been sent out. And so we're seeing a lot more cases because there's been a lot more testing. But we haven't seen that testing is readily available for everyday Americans as, as of yet. And so we still don't know the true number or the true situation or how to even quarantine correctly if we still don't know the exact amount of those that are infected. So it could be a little bit early to start sending folks back to work if we're still not really sure what the, the entire situation is. Yeah, so are they looking for a, a, ma a magic number or something, Anthony? Is that what you're, you're, you're talking about here? I mean, the, the headline or what people are talking about is in you know, 15 days we look at uh, should we start uh, uh, loosening the, the social distancing? And, and I suppose what he's really talking about is, is more people being able to go back to work to try and help the economy move. What you know, he's basically said is the cure worse than the virus. And I mean, we don't want to be flipping about this or anything like that, but are they looking for, or have you heard, is there a specific number that they're looking for as far as a death rate or mortality rate? Um, I haven't heard of a specific number or anything like that that they're looking for, but the big thing is to really kind of get a handle on these regions that are going to be impacted. Um, one of the hardest hit areas is going to be New York City, definitely a large area, a moving force within the U.S. economy, but that area is completely on lockdown, and that's probably going to stay the place to stay on lockdown as it's kind of the epicenter of the coronavirus within the United States. And so we're looking at these large metropolitan areas, even if we start to trickle some 
some of these folks back into the workforce? What industries are going to really be ramped up? And within those industries, is there going to be a demand for those businesses as the rest of the U.S.'s population is kind of still quarantined? And so when we're looking at those that are going to be really impacted the hardest. Andrew Cox covered it very well. We're looking at um, travel. We're looking at service size industries, restaurants, small business owners. Those are going to be the individuals that are going to be hit the hardest. And so we're looking at people starting to get back into the work. Are they just going to be working just for work's sake? Is there going to be actual demand for those goods when everyone else is still stuck at home? So these are going to be the questions that we're going to have to like really strategically work around as we're looking at who are those non-essential employees that are going to be first to kind of hit um, those uh, the workforce again. Yeah, and we, we talked about that uh, before on freight forecasting, too, as well, Anthony, is from a global perspective. You're talking domestically. You know, who goes back to work when and how is that going to be affected by the others that may be going into lockdown? Everybody's on a different timeline. So getting the economy back, uh, even as we get to the back side of this, is going to be a very tricky thing and a very tricky thing for, I, I would say, an economist to try and predict what is going to happen, right, and how to utilize those stimulus packages and what those look like in the future. Well, Michael, you mentioned something about going back to work in two weeks, right? But I'd argue that we haven't really seen the full economic impacts of this because a lot of places haven't taken this lockdown as right. seriously as maybe they could, the social distancing as seriously as they could. We're even seeing videos come out of California of people hanging out on beaches and they're Absolutely. more locked down than most places. Anthony, do you think that, where do you think we are in terms of the economic cycle in this coronavirus and how does this play out? Within the economic cycle, I don't think we've seen the worst of it just yet, um, especially since there's a lot of economic data that's still lagged. I mean, a lot of uh, retail sales numbers is going to show February data when we're in a completely different world in February compared to where we are now. So I don't think we've seen the worst of it just yet. Um, we're looking at where the economy is going to be, knowing that the big bulk of the U.S. economy is going to be consumer spending that's going to be telling for the coming weeks and months because that spending is probably likely to truncate and, and really kind of reel in after a lot of this panic buying kind of subsides. Um, also, the other thing that's going to be happening is that these bank accounts are going to have to start coming down when some of these workers that aren't able to go into the workforce that have been laid off aren't able to spend. Um, there's going to be a lot more, I think, stockpiling of cash as consumer confidence is really, really kind of waning. Um, and so these are going to all be aspects that going to be really considered and kind of gauging the cycle of the economic trend or economic cycle right now. Anthony, we have a question on Facebook. It says, on your point of people being timid about gathering in large crowds, when things return to normal, what is your opinion on people's sentiment towards the concept of a global economy? That's from Hector Padelia. Um, I think that will be a complete shift in the pendulum. I think one of the things that we've seen largely around the, U or not just the U.S., but the global economy is a sense of nationalism. Um, so I don't think that will be completely a swing in the other way. I think definitely there's going to be put something put into perspective as we're seeing more and more countries being affected by this, and um, maybe there there's going to be more unification when uh, situations like these happen. So you'll start to see more camaraderie, perhaps, within uh, countries to set aside some differences. But I don't think by any way that this is going to be any kind of a push towards any kind of global economy unification of sorts, but definitely great to see um, you know, countries come together in this time of need um, and, and really kind of be there for each other, especially different industries. I think one of the things that someone mentioned earlier was um, Ford uh, kind of ramping up some of their machinery to help out on the medical supply side of things. So I think we're starting to see some more strategic partnerships perhaps within certain industries, but I don't think there's going to be um, too, too much of a, a global um, sided uh, unification here. What do you think the winners are at, at the end of all this? I think some, when we look at the winners, we're going to look at who are those big corporations that are going to get bailed out. I think those are going to be potential winners. Um, when we're looking at that. Uh, Definitely streaming platforms, anything exposed to internet. Uh, I think for sure we're looking at telecom, telecommunications, uh, uh, teleconferencing. Those are going to be huge winners. Um, I think these industries are really going to be, uh, of course, anyone that's exposed to medical equipment, um, those are going to be industries that are really going to be impacted, I think, and really ramped up throughout this whole ordeal. Anthony, thank you very much for your time today. and. 
Thank you for keeping abreast of what's going on in the economy, especially in transportation. Next, we'll be talking to Kevin Hill. He works with the Director of Research for the Passport Research Team, Market Expert, Frey Caster. You've seen him on Great Quarter Guys, contributor to many of our shows. Kevin Hill, thank you very much for coming on here. But before that, Paul Morris says, thanks for all the good information. Ingrid Brown, she says, good afternoon, guys. Thank you for all you're doing. No, Ingrid, thank you for all you were doing. Yes. She is a... Uh, She's a driver. She's doing the uh, the yeah. Lord's work out there, as are many of you, especially those tuning in mm -hmm. on Facebook. Hey, Kevin. Very, very good, all things considered. Yeah, good afternoon, Kevin. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in the news. We've seen a lot of event cancellations. I know that the Summer Olympics, for example, in Tokyo will be postponed. Yeah, so it will be postponed. That They announced that uh, today. Uh, it will be postponed until 2021. And I think the, really the only surprising thing about this announcement is how long it took to, to actually postpone the, the Olympics, well behind the NCAA tournament, along with the Major League Baseball opening season, and also NBA and NHL as well. There has been some good news. It comes in the form of traffic, right? Inrix has done a series of reports on traffic around the country, and they noted that speeds in New York are up 52% in the morning. Uh, speeds are up 20 to 30 miles per hour in Boston. I know that all too well. The West Coast is up 50 miles per hour in Seattle, 25 miles per hour in the afternoon. Los Angeles, though, only up 5 miles per hour faster in the morning. LA is LA, LA traffic, right? So, but basically this is what you would expect from uh, places that have announced shut-ins. Basically there's less people on the road, less traffic. We, we, we're on one of the busiest streets in Chattanooga and we might see a few cars go by where, uh, you know, last week there's uh, a, you know, always a busy, busy street right, by, right out the window. Yeah, not anymore around here, right? No, 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 not really. <laughs> no, it's like I a can, ghost town now. Yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, the traffic speeds in Chattanooga are, are up significantly in the morning and in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> no uh, doubt. Grocery store is a big thing we've talked about. A lot of companies have gone and have put algorithms in place for replenishing, for reordering. I know that a lot of that just-in-time manufacturing is out the window. A lot of grocery stores are switching the way they restock, going direct to suppliers. What's going on in that environment? So in that environment, um, basically we, we have hoarding or panic buying, and we're going through that right now. So uh, just-in-time kind of inventory, slim inventory counts aren't working right now. So you're seeing a lot of, of grocery stores who are sold out of product that need product back on the shelves as quickly as possible. So they're circumventing the, the normal supply chain and going directly to the manufacturer to see how much product they can get in on the shelf. So we're seeing this uh, throughout all essential goods, you know, toilet paper, of course, hand sanitizer, uh, foods, canned foods, anything that uh, is, is really flying off the shelves right now. We've been hearing about Loves, too. Loves will be limiting the number of items patrons can buy. You talked about that panic buying, so they have listed. They haven't listed yet, but they're, they're saying that high-demand items. I imagine that's things like bottled water. Anything else? Do you have any more insight on that, Kevin, what Loves is doing? We don't really have too much more details. Uh, the statement that we got from Loves is because demand has greatly increased. We will be limiting quantities as inventory is depleted on certain in-store merchandise. Now, what exactly that is, it's probably bottled water. You know, maybe it could be beef jerky, who knows? Uh, but, but basically anything that is flying off the shelves at Loves will be, uh, be self-rationed by, by the company. What is going on with truck manufacturing? So with truck manufacturing, uh, Dahmer basically uh, closed their production right now. So we're seeing that the, all the big players in, in truck manufacturing have uh, shut down production uh, for anywhere from two weeks on to indeterminate levels. And basically we'll have a note out uh, confirming that later on this afternoon. But it looks like uh, the production is followed by the auto manufacturers who have closed down a couple weeks and we'll probably see some of the parts, you know, engine makers, uh, people connected to the, the auto industry shutting down production for at least a couple more weeks. Interesting. So, uh, Kevin, do you have any uh, information on like the challenges that TMS TMS providers are having uh, as as we see the you know transportation companies having to work remotely? Are there issues there? Yeah. So, as as we've been saying, it's uh, the greatest work from home experiment ever. So, uh, we've been talking to TMS uh, software providers. Uh, John Kingston has, and basically. 
Uh, what we're finding out is that there's some issues with remote working, especially for transportation companies, whether it be freight brokerages or trucking companies. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people work on desktops. A lot of the offices uh, supply desktops to their employees and converting those over to laptops to, to be able to work from home and have all the software working par properly and uploaded has been a challenge. And we'll have more about that uh, this afternoon or tomorrow morning in a story on FreightWaves.com. Mark Daughtry says, Homeland Security sprouted up from 9-11. The 2008 crash woke a lot of people regarding money and spending. What economic boom do you think will come from this? I personally think that it's going to be this work from home industry. Remote work, I think, is going to see it. A ton of inroads, I think warehouse automation, uh, the, the algorithms that mm -hmm. TMS is used. But Kevin, what do you think? Well, Dinner, I, we, we talk about this all the time on Put That Coffee Down and, and other shows that we do. It is going to be uh, the technology that is, is being put in place right now for work at home, work remotely. Uh, necessity is the, uh, the mother of all creation and, and all innovation, and we're going to see a lot of innovation come from this, especially if this remote situation lasts for one, two, three months. So there's going to be a lot of innova innovation and, and new uh, technology that is created to, to kind of patchwork all of this together. Speaking of innovation, here's one for you guys. Jason Bingham says, good show, guys, and good info. Jacobus Energy has mobile fueling operations to help out all those drivers who don't want to touch the gas nozzles. So all sorts of industries cropping up out of this. Yeah, and mo well, mobile fuel has been around for a while, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point using that. I haven't even thought of that. So, hey, Kevin, around the airlines, you know, you're hearing about airline, you know, they're, they're obviously international travel and all the restrictions, et cetera, and, and just canceling flights and letting things sit, but also converting freighters. Do you have any or passenger flights into, into freighters? Uh, was it American Airlines last week that, that ran the first out of, out of Dallas, I guess it was, first of two? Uh, what are you hearing there? So Eric Kulich, uh, who's a, a writer who covers, covers aviation and air cargo for us, has been on top of this throughout. The, the entire process of, of what the airlines are doing and basically you know, cutting routes. There's also, I, I think the Wall Street Journal reported as well, is that uh, there are becoming, they're, they're putting together emergency plans that, that they might ground or halt most, if not all, flights. Uh, and this is a decision that you know, United, Delta, and American predominantly, and Southwest as well, have been making it on their own. Uh, there's also talk about converting some of the passenger flights into basically cargo flights uh, because there's needs to, to get product and, and certainly emergency supplies across the, the, the country domestically uh, in very short order. So that's on the table as well, um, as well as kind of really the effects of, of what this is having on the, the air cargo market. So we have stories every day on this and we'll have some more stories uh, specifically on those items coming up this afternoon and, and tomorrow. Hey, Kevin, there's been a lot of regulatory changes recently with hours of service and more. I know John Gallagher is covering some of that, but what's the latest? So the latest on that, the, the latest FMCSA regular emergency regulation or, or change is really pertaining to private fleets and getting an emergency waiver to, to be for hire, to, to put some more capacity, trucking capacity into the system to to, to, to be you know, to, to allow uh, a free more freedom of movement of goods, especially emergency supplies, you know, food, uh, medical equipment. So it's just really pumping more capacity into the system. Also, Prime. I talked about this on what the truck. I, I've noticed personally, just anecdotally, it's taking longer and longer for things to ship. Also, with Whole Foods in terms of groceries, Linda Baker's on the beat there. What's what's up with that? Yeah, so Prime isn't quite Prime right now. As, as Duna, as you remind me all the time, whenever you're sending me, you know, it, it'll take four or five days for, for something to get delivered to you in Chattanooga. Uh, so, so basically, all essential goods are getting priority. Uh, they, they basically delayed shipments from third sellers into warehouse until the, this crisis has ended. And also, basically, along with that, you know, just kind of how Amazon's handling, you know, outbreaks or infections, COVID-19 infections in their warehousing, and kind of their, their processes and procedures to, to have that sanitized and, and kind of exactly how they're going to handle those situations because they're, they're going to, they're probably going to pop up more and more as, as time goes on. Anything else in the news, Kevin? 
I, you know what, that, that about wraps it up. I mean, Anthony and, and Andrew Cox, uh, you know, talked a lot about the economy and, the, and the, the market and kind of unemployment and where we go from here. And that's really the, the big stories right now. They're the real macro stories or those type of trends and, you know, what the world will look like in the, the, the next few days. Guys, here's a quote from Morgan Stanley on the outlook for transportation sector stocks. It says, fundamentals probably deteriorate before they get better, but volumes pricing have held up so far. A sharp rebound could be a net tailwind, balance sheet risk is low, and even bear case valuations have normalized, which lead us to believe that risk reward for freight transportation is now balanced. Break that down. So, so you know, basically we're, we're seeing 30% year over year outbound tender volume. So, so loads are up, rejections are up, uh, which basically means that, that capacity is really tight right now. And uh, you know, as opposed to the, the, the recession in 2008, 2009, where it was um, you know, basically a financial crisis, this is a, a, a health crisis. So there's a lot of goods that need to be moved. You, know, you have quarantine, you have shut-ins. Um, basically, I think one in four or one in five of Americans are, are basically living under shut-in conditions right now. So those emergency supplies have to move. So it, while it's, it's been bad, you know, the economy is basically grounded down to a halt. Trucking hasn't at all. Trucking is, is actually, as I said, 30% above year over year where it was last year. And you know, so as a sector, it has, um, it has room to run right now. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next week or so, see if volumes still are there um, after all the stores are restocked. How do you feel about that, Michael? Yeah, it seems to me like it's a it's a short term type of thing because it, it, you're going you're going to see it start to taper off. And as we've we've been talking about, as this moves on and the and the economy continues to grind to a halt and this continues, there could be that really steep cliff coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Kevin, we have a few shows coming up to fill in viewers from a, a number of different perspectives. One of those is Put That Coffee Down, which will be tomorrow at noon. Very interactive show. We take a lot of questions on there. Tell us, what will, what will we be covering? Yeah, so that's our Freight Sales podcast that, that we do live, and we're doing it an hour earlier this uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, at 12 p.m. And, and basically, we're going to be covering, uh, you know, Kenny Rogers passed away on Sunday, so no one to hold them, no one to fold them. So, so basically, recognizing when you have a hot deal on the table, and then recognizing when that deal is stalled. So when to fold them, when to hold them, great buying questions to look out for. And certainly, um, you know, when deals are stalled, what to look out for to, to recognize that it's probably not going to happen. It's time to move on and do something else. Michael, how much of a wrinkle does what's going on now put into trying to push deals forward with clients? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Are the clients still going to be in business? Do they yeah. have that money? Are they going to get that stimulus package? It's very, very difficult. It's still, it's still about being real with those people, uh, empathizing and bringing value. What, what, are you, what value are you going to bring? How are you going to help them through this crisis? Yeah. And come out on the other side. What investments? On Thursday, you do a show called Freight Forecasting where you dive deep into sonar. You're looking at data at the speed of light and showing people how to capture that in a bottle. Tell us a little bit about what you'll be looking at this week and what people should be keeping an eye on. Zach Strickland on what the truck yesterday said volumes is definitely a big indicator. Yeah, volumes are a huge indicator. And so what we're going to be looking at is really where are those emerging markets? How are they changing? How are those lanes changing? Like you, you see almost daily that now this, now this market is up. I think it was St. Louis was coming up. Uh, LA, uh, LA Imports is coming up. So what data sets and what are you looking at? What trending are you looking at to see where that next move is to get that capacity there? or if you're a shipper, where you're going to have that capacity crunch, et cetera. So. The Great Quarter guys today will be on at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That is a live show. Kevin, give us a taste. So it will be on at 2 p.m. It will be myself and Andrew Cox and Peter Rinchler from Carrier Direct will be calling in. We're going to talk about FedEx, who, who, uh, who had earnings last week, and then XPO, who has shelved their strategic alternatives for the time being. And we'll talk about the, the freight markets. Uh, Vincent, uh, Brought up a really good point a while ago, you know, will your customers be in business? So we'll talk a little bit about credit risk because credit risk is, is very high for transportation companies right now. Yeah, I can imagine. How does that work in an environment like this? 
it works um, it, it works uh, very delicately, right? So you don't really know uh, when the economy grounds to a halt, you, you don't really know exactly who's a good credit counterparty and who's not, who's illiquid, who's liquid. So there's a lot of nuances around that, and and it's just really hard to tell. So we'll we'll, we'll go in, we'll dive down into that, and, and give maybe two or three tips of of what to do, especially with um, customers that may traditionally be late payers all the time. Wow, Kevin Hill, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So Michael, one big thing that has come up when we were doing some research on how truckers are going to get relief and funding and people in need are going to get funding, and one thing that we uncovered was that the St. Christopher Truckers Relief Fund is funded in part or mostly by the Mid-America Trucking Show, Matt's, which was canceled. Yeah, it's a huge part of their fundraising, right? Un unbelievable. So it was, and the cancellation, the, well, excuse me, not, not talking into the mic here, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the fund that it helps drivers facing financial challenges, et cetera. In 2019, the fund distributed $487,000 uh, to 344 truckers and their families that were in need. So uh, a, a great cause. And unfortunately, um, the show's been canceled, which is a huge cause of that or a huge, huge benefit to it. Yeah, and I imagine they exhausted a lot of those funds thinking that Matt's was coming up. You know, that's kind of the fiscal start of the year for for an organization like them. Yeah, they're nonprofit, right? So, I mean, they're, they, they, they need to get this out and, and get it to the people who need it. And hopefully they do that extremely efficiently. I know they do it very efficiently and, and those funds hit where they need to be. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're most likely out of cash right now. Fortunately, if you'd like to donate the fund, you can. You can visit their website at truckersfund.org. Yeah, definitely. Go to truckersfund.org uh, and make your contributions. Got to help these people out. I mean, we thank truckers. We got to help those that are out there that are hurting and their families and, and support this good cause. Michael, any closing thoughts? Ah, peace and love. Try and stay safe. Hopefully we get to the other end of this and take the quarantines and the social distancing very seriously. We do here. I hope that everybody does so that we can get through this as quickly as possible. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be out of work, as we heard from Andrew. A lot of uh, sectors in the economy that are going to be devastated. And this, the quicker we can get through this, get to the other side and safely get back to work and start, start building this economy back up, the better it's going to be for everybody. Yeah, the, the comments about going back to work in two weeks are curious because as we touched on earlier with Anthony, a lot of communities, a lot of cities haven't really done a full lockdown yet either. Chattanooga, I know, is, isn't even closing all bars and restaurants and, and all non-essentials until Wednesday. Yeah, until Wednesday. That's what I don't understand, too. And, and the talk of two weeks, boy, that, that's really pie-in-the-sky thinking, right? I, I, I think the intention is in two weeks maybe we'll see some type of trends that'll say, okay, maybe we're looking at another four to five weeks, or another three to four months, right? They're hoping to see some some positive things so that we can start talking about these. What are the additional st stimuluses and what is the potential return or start to return to normalcy, right? But what I don't understand, I get that is, we need to, we need to, social, we need to close these things down, but we're gonna do it next week. Yeah, I'm gonna be happy when we start <clears throat> one of these shows and we're able to report the numbers on a downtrend, especially here in the United States and within our own communities. Yeah, absolutely. And having shows talking about what's it like getting back to work and how are you assimilating coming back to work and how many people did you bring back re re uh, rather than help the, or allow them to remain uh, working remotely and what were those efficiencies you got out? I can't wait for those shows. Absolutely. You can learn more. You can follow us on, uh, on Thursday, right? Noon. We'll be right back with the show. Yeah, that's right. Thursday at noon. Yeah. Keep the conversation with us online too. Timothy Dooner on LinkedIn or Twitter. You can find Michael Vincent as well. And you're also on Twitter now. Is Vincent the I Dude? I Vincent believe. the Dude. That's right. So keep it going. We're more than happy to answer any of your questions on and off the air. Thank you for joining us on Freightwaves Coronavirus Freight Market Update.